Hey, what's going on, everybody? Here's your boy Ed Delgado here coming at you live here on a Friday night. Boy, have things been live tonight on social media? Obviously, you guys are in the know, so you guys have an idea what's going on. Man, my uh, my video is a little choppy. It's a little weird. It's the green screen and everything. We're we're working on that here. Well, anyway. So obviously the Supreme Court came in with a decision today on whether or not to hear the Texas case and essentially what ended up happening today or this early this late this afternoon, or early this evening. When the SCOTUS decided that they weren't going to hear the case on the grounds that Texas didn't have standing. Now they didn't weigh on the merit of the this particular case. So on social media, a lot of people have just kind of say, you know what, that's it, F it, we're done. It's game over at this particular point. And I think it's really hard to not feel that way, especially when we're seeing all of the evidence popping out in front of us. We're seeing everything come out um, from the voter fraud to all these irregularities. It's very disheartening when you see this and i think the frustration in this here is that we have well over 74 million people here in the united states that have voted for president trump that in effect feel like they're not being heard now i've heard a lot of people say you know that the supreme court justices that the president had appointed well they turned their back on him and everything and one of the first thoughts that kind of came to mind to me on this was what were you guys thinking was going to happen? Were you looking for actual constructionalists that were loyal to the Constitution, or were you looking for partisan uh, judicial activists? Now, I know for the longest time, conservatives have been wanting constructionalists, people that saw the Constitution for what it was, and in this particular case. Now, I haven't read the decision. I know there's a lot to go over as far as that is concerned. But, you know, let me see here. See, every time I do a broadcast, I don't know if I'm going to get some kind of mean, crazy thing or something. No, I don't have that. Okay. Anyway, we have one in a construction list that's going to rule based on the Constitution. And in doing so, what will end up happening is you're going to get decisions you're not going to like. You're going to get decisions that are going to go against what you think should happen. See, when you, you have these liberal activists, they're going to side with the left, whatever the, the, the current leftist dogma is for that current day and age. We don't want that on the right. Now, I have to assume at this particular point that that is where the majority of the court had leaned, and that's why we had the 7-2 decision with Alito and Thomas descending. Now, that being said... I'm going to tell you guys, while things may seem hopeless at the moment, you may feel beaten, you may feel kind of drummed down. And I was talking with somebody earlier tonight, I was in their chat as they did a video. One of the things that, that I like to do personally, and I recommend everyone do the same, is anytime that you kind of feel like you're up against the wall, anytime you feel like you've reached your limit, you need to take a step back and you need to reflect on why it is you're doing what you're doing, why it is that you are in the fight to begin with, where you came from and why, what is your purpose? Once you know what your purpose is, your origin, as it were, and you understand why it is you clench your fist and decided to enter into the fight, now you let that guide you, you let that carry you forward. Because it's very easy to be beaten down. As a matter of fact, as a very, as a very, one of the one of the, the key tenets of the left is to beat their opposition into submission, to constantly push them into the ground, gaslight them until they want to be like, you know what, enough, I'm done. Do whatever it is you guys are gonna do. I just want to be left the hell alone. But the thing is that we know about the left is that they'll never leave you alone. And this is something that. 
And, and Orlando Owens is in the chat room here. And I'm so glad that you said this right here, Orlando. I am so happy you said this. Orlando said, and I'm going to highlight this bad boy here because this is, this is definitely worth putting up. He goes, are we ready to start doing the work for 21 and 22? And there was a, an article that Christopher Lawrence had written in the Wisconsin Conservative Digest. And I'm going to link it. Um, I'm about to put it in there afterwards. But... This is something that we need to look at because I think no matter what happens in the presidential election, win or lose, whether or not Trump ends up taking office in 21, January 20th, or Biden ends up being inaugurated January 20th, I think the right need to start to rebuild again. And we need to do it in a way that has not been done before. See, for so long, a lot of people on the right, what they have done is just simply placated to the left. You just wanted to get along. You didn't want to be hated. And if anything, what President Trump has, has taught you is you need to, number one, double down on your principles. Number two, if somebody's going to hate on you, well, let them hate. Don't let that deter you from what your goal is. And I think third, and, and this is something I've been yelling about for years, People on the right, we have been trying so damn hard to be liked, to be loved, to not be called all the things under the sun. Embrace it. If that's what they're going to call you, let them call you what they're going to call you. Inferior people will do that. They will refer to you in the pejorative. They will call you a racist. They will call you a misogynist. They will call you a bigot. They will call you xenophobic. They will call you everything like that. But oftentimes, what you come to learn when you dig deeper, when you go under the surface there, what you end up coming to understand is that those very people, all they're doing is projecting those bad qualities of themselves onto you. Now, am I saying that everybody that calls you something negative like that is projecting? Yeah, for the most part. At least that's been my experience. I don't know about you guys. But... I think what we need to do is we need to realize we need to understand that it's time to get down and dirty. It's time to get into the fight. It's time to actually, you know what, kick ass and take names and forget about chewing bubblegum. You know, if somebody wants to get into a fight with you, then you know what, welcome to fight. You have to. Because this idea of just trying to be nice and, and just, you know, holding hands, singing kumbaya. I don't think you guys understand yet. And, and if you don't, it's, I think it's one of two things. is cognitive dissonance, or you're not paying attention to what the radical left is saying. They're talking truth and reconciliation commissions. They're talking wanting to round folks up. They're talking about all this crazy stuff here, re-education. And it sounds like a nightmare scenario. It's almost like if you married, you know, Brave New World, 1984, and Animal Farm, and just put all three books into one, one book, you know, just made an amalgamation of it. You know, it's absolutely absurd. Brian, how are you tonight? Gary, how are you tonight? Orlando, what do we got here? How do we grow the tent if we have maxed out the Republican white vote? Oh, Orlando, you know that question. You know the answer to that all too well. And I think President Trump was right on track in doing that when he brought in folks from the LGBTQ alphabet people community, when he brought in the Hispanics, the black folks, you know, the blacks that the legs said, um, I'm sure there was a LGBT one. Um, I mean, hell, there are Muslims that were working with Trump, by the way. Y'all saw the news earlier, I think it was yesterday, President Trump once again brokered another peace deal in the Middle East. Morocco is now recognizing and normalizing relationships with uh, Israel. But that is a great question right there, and I think we have our answer, but of course there's certainly more. And that's where I think, you know, and Orlando Owens is, is, is a good man to follow if you haven't followed him on uh, social media, because he here is a man that, that He's been in conservative politics for a while. He understands this. He also understands the plight of black America, being a black man himself. And he gives a very unique perspective onto these things on how to expand 
the so-called big tent of the Republican Party. Now, that's just one way that we can rebrand. The other thing is to actually get into the cultural aspects of things. There have been many people on social media that have talked about this at length, and I think this is an opportunity that we really need to take hold of and run with. Because the left, well, they've controlled culture for so long. And as Andrew Breitbart had pointed out so astutely many years ago, that politics is downstream from culture. If you don't control the culture, eventually you will not control the politics. So how do you go about doing that? Well, I think there's a number of different ways. And that's that. I think that involves everything from small content creators to independent artists and musicians. And there's a lot more to it there. And I know I'm going to get into this in a, in a little bit. I'm going to be working with my brother on some other stuff here later on. Um, and I know many of you guys are going to be doing your thing, too. So I'll be definitely working with you guys and promoting that. But I want to kind of switch gears here because this is something I was, so I woke up this morning. If I look tired, it's because I've been up since like 5 a.m. And I was like bright eyed and bushy tailed, just really ridiculous. But in doing so, I was also hella productive. I mean, I got laundry done. I made breakfast, um, did several other things. And then I had to do some research because I was hearing this term, this, this word, this, this phrase here, Fifth generational warfare. And I was racking my head, what exactly do we mean by this? When I think fifth generation warfare, initially, my, my thought process on this was just a war of hearts and minds, a war of just trying to manipulate people. And I wasn't too far from the truth on that. So I did a little deep dive into this here, into what first, second, fourth, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, I'm all out of order here. But I went into a little bit of a dive into this, and I wanted to study this because in doing this research, I was able to kind of take a look historically and see that about once every 75 years, there is some great existential threat that is a potential nation-ending event here in America give you the example. So if we go back to the founding of America, which wasn't 1619, 1775, the Revolutionary War started. Now, obviously, that was the catalyst for what we now have as America. But from 1775 to 1783, you have the Revolutionary War. Now, for 78 years, from 1783 until 1861, Yes, you had skirmishes. Yes, you've had various things going on. What did you have? The War of 1812, the Spanish Armada, you had the Barbary Wars. But none of those were any great threat to America as in ending it. I mean, yes, the British invasion was potential, but ultimately wasn't that. But So for 78 years. So from 1861 to 1865, you had the American Civil War. Now, the American Civil War could be broken down into probably about two or three different things if we're going to go very basic about it, but it was holding the Union together. It was the idea of whether or not a human being can be property and should be treated as such, and then there was a the constitutionality of it. Now, Civil War goes on from 1861 to 1865. Then we fast forward to, eight, to 1939. Now, we're looking at 74 years between 1865 and 1939. Yes, once again, various skirmishes, World War I, a lot of different things going on. However, none of those battles presented such a great existential threat that could potentially end the United States of America. As a matter of fact, the U.S. was considered to be protected by the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Nobody could travel over there and invade, but yet we could so certainly go aboard. Now, you got World War II. That went from 1939 to 1945. Then you had a period of 75 years going into, and I'm just calling it to 2020 here. I think the 
timing could be earlier. And yes, in between, you had the Korean War. Yes, you had Vietnam. Yes, you had the Iraq Wars. But it, once again, none of those were great threats to potentially ending the U.S. But yet here we are now, 75 years later from 1945, here in 2020. We are now, I think, at the precipice of a potential nation-ending event. Now, obviously, these things took, took place over the course of the year, every 75 years or so. And how long something like this will carry forth, I don't know. But if what I'm putting together here has any accuracy, it's a make it or break it. We're either going to stand as a free nation to live up to the ideals of our forefathers or we become something else entirely different. And in doing my research here, I was looking over the different types of warfare. So when we talk about first generational warfare, we're looking at, you have to think ancient times. You have to think, you know, uniform soldiers, a phalanx, columns, uh, flanking maneuvers, things like that. Second generational warfare is early modern warfare. You're talking muskets, um, you know, breech loading weapons. These are the type of things that, you know, from the Revolutionary War going forward. And this goes up until the invention of the machine gun. Now, this is a term that was coined in uh, excuse me, 1989 by the U.S. military, second generational warfare. Third generational warfare now deals more specifically with technological warfare. It's the idea of using speed, tactics, technology, trying to take your enemy out from the rear, cut them off from their supplies. Okay, that's third generational warfare. Fourth generational warfare, I'm taking a look at some of my notes here. What they talk about here is a return to decentralized forms of warfare, blurring the lines between work and politics, combatants and civilians due to na nation states loss of their monopolies, of uh, their near monopolies or combat forces returning to modes of conflict common in pre-modern times. So the best example of this you would have would be terrorism. So fourth generation, you think, you know, 9-11, World Trade Center bombing back in, I think it was uh, beginning of Clinton's term. Um, you, you know, the Boston Marathon bombing. And there's various different other examples I can certainly look into and give you on that. Fifth generational warfare. Now, this is the one that we, this one's a big one. And I don't think a lot of people realize this is the kind of thing that we're in here right now. See, oftentimes when I have talked about civil war, I have also talked about the idea that any civil war that we have here in this country is going to be so incredibly unconventional. It'll be unlike anything we have ever seen before. We're not going to have great armies standing on one side of a valley and the other side of the valley and just kind of doing their thing. It'll be nothing like that. I think it'll be definitely smaller skirmishes. It'll be kind of what we've seen over the summer uh, with, you know, fights with Antifa uh, and, and definitely worse than that. But in doing my research, this is what I got out of it. And I think, you, I think you'd be very hard pressed to disagree with me on what we're dealing with here now is indeed fifth generational warfare. What I wrote down here is that it, what they talk about here is battles of perception and information. Fifth generational warfare is also cultural and moral war, which distorts the perceptions of the masses to give a manipulated view of the world in politics. So the world in politics and how it's viewed is convoluted. It becomes one and the same. Okay. And it's manipulated by, well, if we take a look here in present day, your mainstream media, legacy media, your ABCs, NBCs of the world, your CNNs, Fox News to a great extent. Um, they're the ones that control and shape the narrative, the newsrooms, the Drudge Report, Washington Post, um, 
this is important because when you take a look, once again, like I mentioned, the left have taken over the cultural institutions. Whether we're talking schools, colleges, something is what you might think is innocuous as cartoons and comic books. The left has an extreme hold on these things, okay? And as a result of that, they're the ones that can push a particular agenda, whether it be through a movie, through a speech, through your local news. And that is what's going to shape the reality for people because for those people that have said, and there have been polls out there where folks, had, had they known of a Hunter Biden in his laptop, as it relates to Joe Biden, they would not have voted for Joe Biden. Had they realized that Joe Biden would be possibly talking about a lockdown nationwide, they would not vote for Joe Biden. But because the mainstream media did not produce those stories and they didn't do anything to, I mean, they might have put it on like page 16 way in the back. But because they didn't do that, the vast majority of people were not aware of it. So therefore, their their vote was influenced exactly how the media wanted it to happen. Because if we look at how the mainstream media is today, it operates as essentially the PR wing of the Democrat Party. So this civil war that we're dealing with today is indeed, in my belief, and, and feel free to please argue with me if I'm wrong, we are indeed talking here fifth generational warfare and yes we will see elements of fourth generational warfare in there too no doubt but it, it this is a battle of perception this is a battle of information and who holds the centers and the hubs for information silicon valley uh tech giants you know the microsoft's the google's the facebook's and those people are radical leftists themselves want to go into the comments here I know Orlando posted something as we were talking earlier. He mentioned um, being in a natural fit to our to our movement. Black men support the return of gun ownership for African American men. Not all felons, I get it, but a lot of them. African American men should look at our movement and would support it because it includes them. Just an FYI, and you know what? You are absolutely correct on that. And I think all men. And this is one of those things, and, and I'm going to talk about this at a later date here, uh, a return to masculinity. There was an article I pulled earlier where this one guy was talking about toxic masculinity and how, how it's so terrible. But see, that's one of the problems that we're dealing with today. You have generations, not, not one generation, but like two or three that have not had a positive male role model in, in their family, that have not been able to raise young boys to become young men because many of these young men weren't even men themselves. So how would they know how to defend their family and take care of theirs if they didn't have proper mentorship or realize what it meant to take care of their family, even in the most extreme circumstance where the necessary use of a firearm should it come to that. And I think that is, I think your, your point is 100% on that. And I think we can even extrapolate that to white folks that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, Hispanic folks across the board, black folks across the board, Asians across the board. This is something I believe that transcends all folks. And I, I think you're absolutely correct on that. Lario mentions on here. Lario de Leon, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Time to focus on Generation Z, especially since they are one of the most conservative generations that is, and will continue to vote uh, continue to be voting aid in the next couple of elections. Get them informed and interested before they start going back to school. And that's an interesting point. Time and again, I see a lot of these parents talking about, you know what, we got to get these kids back in school. And I do agree with that. We do need to get the kids back in school for nothing else, socialization. But we need to be able to get them to go back to school and not be six feet across from each other because that's not how kids operate. They're usually right on top of you. And it's interesting because a lot of these people were like, we the same folks that complain about the school system. And it's like, you do realize you have an opportunity. I understand you're working. You spend a lot of time out there. You're 
you you know, overtime, two jobs maybe, doing what you got to do to to make ends meet in your family. I get that. God bless you. But your children also need you there at home too. So sometimes that means burning the candle on both ends of the stick. Sometimes that means putting in the extra, extra hours to help your kid figure these things out. It ain't easy, but it is your responsibility as your kid's number one teacher. Gary Russell put on here. He goes, if they were smart enough to do research and listen to you, Rush Limbaugh, OBFSU, they, they would have known that. And unfortunately, I think, you know, and thank you very much for that compliment to put me in that kind of category with these folks. But um, it's interesting because I think a lot of folks, when you're kind of stuck into your own echo chamber, you're, it, it, it's hard to break out of that. And for me, I think that's one of the reasons why I make it a point when I get my news, I get it from right leaning sources, left leaning sources. I get it from all over the place. And the reason I do that is because I want to challenge what it is that number one, I believe what my thought process is. And I want to see who's putting out BS, who's putting out things that make sense and who's framing what, because how a lot of these folks frame these articles, well, that's going to be a huge key point there too. Again, fifth generational warfare. So, all right, guys, I'm going to call it a night here in just a minute. I want to thank you guys all here for joining me tonight. I actually had intended only to go about 15 minutes, and here I'm coming on a half hour. No, Hilario, I'm not doing a two-hour show tonight. I've been up since 5 a.m., but uh, no, we'll probably do something over the weekend. We got some other stuff cooking up here. Obviously, Wisconsin Supreme Court is going to be taking a case here tomorrow. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting one to keep an eye out. I think it was President Trump had sued uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So that's going to be something to, to uh, want to keep an eye on there. Let's see real quick here. Gary mentioned, I didn't mention myself because I'm not that smart enough to be in that category. Oh, no, make no mistake about it. I'm not claiming to be smart at all. No, as a matter of fact, I'll be the first person to tell you I I know absolutely nothing, uh, and it's probably safer that way. But um, Orlando, what do we got here? Use the time with your children now to pick their heads and see what they're thinking. Sit in or play back the recordings of their Zooms. Keep the Zoom going in the classroom, and that is absolutely correct. It's very important that as parents, you know, we – we get to understand and know what's going on in that classroom. Keep those lines of communication open with their teachers, especially if they're doing online learning. And you know what? As much as you love your kids and trust your kids, don't trust your kids when it comes to, did you get your homework done, hon? Oh, you did? Okay. And then all of a sudden you get an email like three days later. Hey, your son's like really screwing up here. It doesn't turn into any assignment. So just keep an eye out for that. But anyway, guys. I got to call tonight. Christine, how are you? Christine was about to call in. See, I can't be up too late. I'm hurting. Plus, my wife's got a lot of work for me tomorrow. We we got some got a little couple projects going on here in the house, so got to get that done. But anyway, guys, I got to call it a night, though. Seriously, it's been a long day. I got to catch some Z's. I want to at least like spend a few minutes and just uh, – do a little gaming, something I haven't been able to do in a few weeks. But thank you guys all here for joining in. Make sure you check out our website, plusultramedia.com. And then, of course, as always, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell or whatever else you got to hit, depending on the platform you're listening to this on. And I will check in with you guys this weekend. And, of course, the Caramel Conservative Podcast, 8 p.m. Tuesday night, Central Standard Time. And I will see you then. I'm out.